The scripture says in verse 8, the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he'd formed. Out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight, and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Father, bless this book now. In your name I pray. Amen. Go ahead and be seated. We have two trees mentioned in verse number 9, tree of life, tree of knowledge. In Genesis chapter number 3 and verse number 22, when they had eaten the forbidden fruit, had sinned, and now were under judgment, the Lord God in verse 22 said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. Now let's stop for just a moment. The greatest lie, the most deceptive lie, is a lie that is built on the basis of truth. There's a mixture of truth and error. When Satan said, The Lord doth know, the moment you eat, you'll become as God, he told the truth. It came to pass exactly as he said. But then he interjected a lie because what he did was assault the character of God. He said, God doth know. In other words, he's hiding something from you and you can't trust his character. There was a reason for God hiding that or keeping that from them. There's a reason God keeps a lot of things from us. But exactly as Satan said, it happened. So the devil can give you the truth and lead you so far with the truth. But there comes a point when he has to take you and deviate from the truth. And that's where you have to have discernment. You have to discern because Satan's a master at it. He's a master. That's a deception. And deception is, 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 is what's happened here. The Bible said it's the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. To de beguile means to deceive Eve. And here's the, here's the damning thing about deception. If you know you're deceived, you're not deceived. Deception is when you don't know you're deceived. You think you're believing the truth. You think you have what's right. You think you're doing the right thing. And all along you are deceived. So in verse number 22, the Lord God said, Behold, a man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. Now what have you got in your Bible there? Is that a period or is that a colon? That's a colon. Colon doesn't end a sentence in English. We've got a problem here. It's not ended. Note what follows in verse number 23. In plain words, he said it and left it open. That's what he did. He made the statements, a statement, but he left it open. Why? Because the consequences are so horrible. They're so horrible. Why? Because he could eat this and it would keep his flesh alive, but he'd live like that forever. That would be a horrible torture and torment is to live forever without the life of God. That's a horrible thing. I mean, when you make it 50, 60, 70 years, I mean, you think you've lived a long time. That's nothing. That's not even a passing vapor when we deal with eternity and everlasting things. You're just here a while. You make your, you make your, your, your place on, the sta on stage, on the scene. You show up. You're here a while. Then you're gone. And the next generation comes on, does the same. And then the next generation, the next generation. So it behooves us tonight to be certain that what we believe is the truth. Yes, sir, not part of the truth, but the whole truth. And the Lord Jesus said, I am the way, the what? Truth and the life. So he said in verse number 23, Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. Now look at verse 24. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims, and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Anytime you see a Hebrew word end in im, notice B-I-M-S, beam. When you see a Hebrew word end in beam, it's a plural word, okay? Hebrew has singular, dual, and plural. Plural means three or more. So what you have here is a creature that is mentioned in a plural sense. Now, how do you do that? Well, if you go to the book of Ezekiel, you'll find out that a cherubim, when they show up, they show up with the very throne of God. Cherubim in the Bible are very, uh, 
honored, uh, powerful uh, 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 creatures. They covered the mercy seat inside the Holy of Holies. The cherubim with a flaming sword to keep the way of the tree of life. They're protectors. In the book of Ezekiel chapter number 28 of Satan, he said, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. And you ought to do a little, writ, a little, little word study on that if you'd like to when you get home. Look up the word covereth in Ezekiel 28 as it relates to the cherubim that covereth. And I have set thee so, he said. In plain words, he was in a place of authority, great authority over other creatures. So a cherubim, when it shows up, is here for a reason. There's no way they were going to get by that cherubim. And I'll tell you something else, they'll never get by it either, and that's an angel. Nothing could get by that. That includes Satan. Nothing could approach that tree. This cherubim with a flaming sword. The Bible said he saw heaven open, behold a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. And out of his mouth goeth a what? Two-edged, sharp, two-edged sword. The Bible said the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. It's a powerful, powerful thing. So it could be, it could be a type of something, but also be a literal thing. But it's guarded. So when we start, we start with the truth about the tree of life. Now, Judaism has what's called Kabbalah, Kabbalah, however they want to pronounce it. And in Judaism, Kabbalah talks about the sephirot. And the sephirot in Judaism is the tree of life. What it is, it's a counterfeit to the truth. Here's what you find in the Bible. You find it all over history. You find the truth and then a counterfeit. There's another Jesus. There's another gospel. There's another spirit. These are all counterfeits. So how do you know the counterfeit? God's given you two things tonight to really know the difference between the truth and a counterfeit. What are they? The written word of God and the Holy Ghost. And with the Holy Spirit and the word of God, you can know a counterfeit. You can try the spirits by the Holy Spirit and you can search the scriptures as he told them to determine, be as the Bereans did, search the scriptures to determine what kind of doctrine that you're getting. What are they saying? You'll find that a lot of, a lot of uh, cults will give you a partial truth. See, here's your counterfeit again. Here's your deception. They'll give you a partial truth and then they'll build a lie on top of that truth. And you believe the truth but you have to be able to differentiate the lie from the truth. You've got to be able to discern the two. So in the book of Revelation, if you look to turn there with me, chapter number two, Revelation chapter two tonight, the tree of life shows up again. Revelation chapter number two and verse number seven. The scripture says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. <coughs> Capital S. The Holy Ghost. Uh, the Spirit saith unto the churches, To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Now who are we talking to here in Revelation? Angel of the church of Ephesus. And on down it goes to the seven churches of Asia Minor. Doctrinally, what you're looking at in Revelation chapter 2 and 3 is the tribulation. It's not the age of grace. It's the tribulation period. Okay? Why this? Because these people aren't born again. That's why. The church of God is gone. It leaves out in chapter number uh, four. It's raptured. It's gone. You're the church of the firstborn. The first one's born of the spirit. So these people eat of the tree of life. But it doesn't stop there. Look at chapter number 22, Revelation. Revelation 22 and verse 2. It says in verse 1, He showed me a pure river, the water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb, and in the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for what? Well, for the healing of the nations. Where are we here in chapter number 22? We're in eternity. We've already come through the millennium. The judgment the great white throne judgment, and we've headed off into, the, into eternity. And here these people have to have leaves to treat healing or heal by. In plain words, their bodies need to be healed. And so therefore they have the tree of life. 
The tree of life, therefore, is not something that gives you spiritual life, eternal life, like the life that you get when you're born again. Look at that in John chapter number 5 and verse number 26. John 5, 26. John 5, 26. For as the Father hath life in himself. Okay. Now what kind of life is that? That is life of Almighty God. That's eternal. And it wasn't given to him. Nobody gave him that life. He's always lived. I was listening to a thing yesterday, and, and it's always good to get a, to get a little uh, uh, comedy in the day, you know, something to, a little lighthearted thing. And they had this uh, theoretical physicist talking about how that, here's, he says this, now he says, well, you know, there was a time when there was nothing. Absolutely nothing. And then there was an explosion. And from that explosion, you've got this. And I say, uh, sir, what exploded? Exactly. If there was nothing, what exploded? And he thinks he's smart. That's sad, folks. That really is. It's called ex nihilo. In other words, out from nothing. Well, the Bible says in Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning God created. Bereshith bara Elohim hashamayim. Bara means to create from nothing, to bring into existence from nothing. God is the only one that can bring into existence from nothing. And he did that. He didn't need anything to build on. He brought it into existence. How? He spoke it. So you either believe in the eternity of matter, but where did, where you, you, I don't know if they believe in the eternity of matter because he said there was a time when there was nothing. You remember that? Well, the matter is not eternal. Where'd that come from? Or you believe in the eternity of God. You see the mess we're in? Which one will you take? Will you believe that there was absolutely a time when there was absolutely nothing and all of a sudden, all of a sudden something exploded and came from nothing? What exploded? <laughs> That's called the Big Bang Theory. <laughs> Let me tell you something. They're going out with a Big Bang. You talk about ignorance. I wouldn't want to put ignorance like that on display. That's sad. It really is. God created the heaven and the earth. Here's the problem. It's hard for the human mind. It's hard for our mind, my mind, your mind, anybody's mind, to really grasp how big God is. Isn't it? I mean, look out there at that creation. I don't know how far it goes. I have no idea. I don't care, really. But where did it come from? It came from a being who only spoke and it came into existence. That's Almighty God. So when he gives them a tree over here in Revelation, he gives it to them for the healing of the nations. The Bible talks about a time that's called the dispensation of the fullness of times. Now we know what the dispensation of grace is. We know what that is. We know all these dispensations in the Bible, they're for a reason. We understand that. A dispensation is a period of time when God deals with men according to a standard, a law, or something of that nature, a revelation. But the dispensation of the fullness of times has to do when God will gather together and God will be all in all. All in all. So what does that mean? That's a powerful statement. Because what my understanding of it from Scripture is that when Christ and the Father and the Holy Spirit and the fullness of the Godhead come together in such a sense probably that you have a hard time differentiating specifically yet you know you're looking at three in one you're looking at the trinity god is all in all and that's something and there'll be something there that wasn't there at the beginning it'll be the body of a man who lived a sinless perfect life and who died but that body will never be able to die again. And what happened there, that's another thing to make you think. Here's what Bullinger says about Genesis 2.9. He says, the tree supporting and continuing the life which had been imparted. Now that's the way Bullinger says it. I'm not saying that I necessarily agree with that, but that's his take on it. It's a hard thing to explain. 
Can you imagine now when God breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life and he became a living soul? Was he alive? Was he alive? Certainly he was alive. Uh, what kind of life did he have? You see, he had life that came from God because God gave him that life. And as the poet says, the breath of God became the soul of man. That puts us close to the Lord, doesn't it? Yes, it does. That puts us awful close to him. Soul in Hebrew is nephesh. The soul of man brought us together. There's something about a man and God that are connected in such a way. But you see, even after they had sinned, even after they had sinned, they could possibly have lived on if they had eaten of this tree. Now, why was that tree there and what's that tree for and what does that tree represent? Well, to Kabbalah, Judaism, the Sephirot represents an emanation, an emanation in various phases of that monad that Plato talked about. And I know we get off into all that stuff, but it simply means this, that there is some kind of a great universal spirit up there that makes itself known in various ways through various agencies. And an emanation is what you're getting into, like Sophia. She brought Jehovah into existence. And Jehovah is the creator of the Old Testament. See, Jehovah. And he is what's called a demiurge. He's a lesser God, but he doesn't know it because he came from Sophia. Now, does the Bible teach that? Of course not. Of course not. But this is what you get from Kabbalah. This is what you get from the occult world. See, what they do, they take a truth. What is the truth? Jehovah is the creator of the Old Testament. That's the truth. But then they build a lie on top of it and they distort it and pervert it and then they repackage it and they dish it out to people. And when they give it to them, here's what you get. You get into the occult world and they look at, they patronize you. What does that mean? They look down on you. Oh, you're one of those Christians. All you've got is the Bible. Uh, if you only knew what we know, do you remember the Gnostics initiated into the higher knowledge? It, you, if you only knew what we know, you'd be with us. Well, we pity you poor Christians. Now, here's the difference. The Holy Ghost in, lives within my soul. He changed my life and he gave me a love for the Bible and a love for the Lord Jesus Christ. <coughs> no doubt about that. That can't be counterfeited. And there's not a one of them. There's not a one. You go out and you look at them, you begin to look at what they teach and what they say, and you'll find out that there is a general agreement among all of them as to certain things that they believe. Each culture puts its own little spin on it. But the truth is, they have rejected the truth. Today, if you look at the religious atmosphere in America, you're going to find that the vast majority of Americans believe in some kind of a higher power, some kind of a man upstairs, some kind of a spirit, see? And that's enough to pull them all together. They don't have to agree in the specifics, just agree in that. That's good enough. And that is the foundation for the Antichrist. And that's what this leads to. That's what it all leads to. It either goes to the truth of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, or it goes to a lie. And the Bible says in 2 Thessalonians 2, because they receive not the truth, but they'll believe the lie, to pleasure and unrighteousness, the lie, God will send them a what? And the reason for the strong delusion is because there will be those who believe the truth during the tribulation. See? But not these people. So if you're in this crowd today, and you're arrogantly strutting around telling people how smart you are and how much more you know than a Christian does with his Bible, you're the one in 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2 that's going to get the lie. You're going to believe it, and it'll seal your doom in eternal damnation. Father, bless your word. Thank you for the time together in your house. Bless these dear folk tonight. Be with them as they go and bring us back again safe Sunday. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you, folks.